are back. Thanks so much for coming back. So this is one of our inspiring journeys. And anybody who's been at an India Global Forum will know that we have these chats from time to time. Absolutely delighted to be on stage with you again, Vivek. This is absolutely mine. Really great to have you. Now, actor, philanthropist, social uh, impact investor. But let's, we're going to get to all that in a minute. But the last time I was with you on stage, we talked about the fact that you had just been in India's most binge-watched show, Inside Edge. That is right. And yet again, we're back here again, most binge-watched show in India, Dharavi Bank. That's right, Dharavi Bank. Now, the big question I have is, the last time I spoke, you had a mustache. <laughs> There's been some manscaping <laughs> since then. What's behind it? Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> I think creative calls. Uh, the mustache came off pretty recently. Okay. Um, and I had to have the mustache for uh, creating this very strong, very desi, very Indian macho kind of character. character look. And then uh, back to being the guy next door. All right. Excellent. Okay. So now you are no newbie to the power of streaming services. That is right. Uh, we've, I think, got one of your... Yeah, I think Karan Bedi is in the audience, the CEO of MX Player. All right, big wave. Uh, we've had COVID in between. That's right. What has, what do you think has been the biggest change in the film industry in the last five years? I think COVID has had a very interesting uh, effect on viewing patterns. Um, all the OTTs were, were going through the biggest boom that they've ever seen, especially in India. And India is this market for double-digit growth. Um, and what was fascinating was uh, OTTs were always trying to pitch and compete against uh, theatrical releases. Mm. And as long as the theatrical release option was alive, the affordability of content to pitch more than what a theatrical would be able to deliver and get that on an exclusive OTT release mm. was always more difficult. But when COVID happened and theaters shut down and then you had all kinds of rules which are more than, not more than 50% occupancy, the numbers on theatrical drastically dropped. The security levels for being able to know for sure that whether you will be allowed to release or whether there will be a new wave and people will just stop theaters, uh, government will stop theaters again. So people went to OTTs and they saw a flood of content uh, at mm. more reasonable pricing. And uh, I think that exclusivity also changed patterns in viewing behavior. So people went to, uh, to, to OTT a lot more because they were spending more time at home, work from home. Um, we all know how that went. Yeah, I wasn't a fan, were you? <laughs> so, not really, no. <laughs> I, I believe in that physical interaction and engagement. Yeah. But that led to extreme viewership. Like mm -hmm. uh, Karan's platform, MX Player, ended up which shows that crossed a billion minutes in terms of eyeballs, in terms of viewing. Extraordinary. Uh, yeah, it's extraordinary numbers. And, and that happened mainly because you had this, this whole, you know, mm. COVID where people had the kind of time to be able to see more content. Did it have a difference, did it make a difference in how you made films as well? Well, yes, I think um, you gear up to an OTT audience. Mm -hmm. You gear up to building characters that need to last 400 minutes rather than you know, 120 to 150. You create different character arcs. And then you also think about writing a Bible for season one, two, and three. Right. So you need to have an ability to create an arc not just for the beginning, middle, and end of a movie, which is finite, but you need to think of it from the beginning and what it would look like as an evolution over the next three years, mm. what could be the potential content in the same space coming out? What could be the changes in the viewership patterns and what people want to see? Because three years is a long time to sustain yeah. a show. Interesting. All right. Well, let's, let's move along your own personal arc from um, actor to philanthropy, and then we'll move into the social impact investing. Sure. But why did you start your philanthropy journey? What was the, the impetus behind that? I think um, I can remember it like yesterday. It was, uh, it was interesting because in India, cricket and cinema, uh, it's almost like a deification, right? So you achieve instant superstardom. You achieve mm. this, this mania, this craze. But the love and the hate, two <laughs> sides of the same coin, are equally personal. Mm. So it's more like we love you or we hate you. Mm. you know? um, the critics build you up, they tear you down. 
And when you're about 25 years old, uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in the success, your first failure, your first success. Mm. Um, you're the blue-eyed boy and suddenly you're being criticized or lobbies, uh, you know, different um, uh, powers at play, uh, egos to deal with beyond the creativity. So I went through my own journey pretty early in my career and um, it was a difficult one. And I was moping about, mm -hmm. uh, why me? <laughs> and my mom, uh, who I look up to as a personal hero, uh, kind of changed that for me. She said, when you had the success, when you were standing up there receiving all these accolades and awards, did you ask why me? And she said, what are you doing this evening? I said, nothing really. And she said, I want you to come somewhere with me. And she took me to Tata Memorial Hospital, mm -hmm. the pediatric cancer wing. And that day I learned two things. The first thing that I learned was I'm crying about a career issue. I'm upset about a personal problem. And then I see these seven, eight, nine-year-old kids. Um, the hair's fallen out because of chemotherapy. They've got bloodshot red highs, dealing with leukemia. Uh, their parents are there. Everyone's so worried and anxious. And they're dealing with it okay. They're mm. fighting back. Um, so I realized that my problems were nothing. But the second understanding was even more profound. I didn't have to do anything. I just walked into the room and these kids were smiling. Mm. I didn't have to carry toys or gifts or say something nice or do something nice just by being there, mm. just walking in, their eyes lit up. They were smiling you know, from year to year. And I realized I can bring joy. I can leverage this celebrity mm. to actually ease the pain and bring joy. And that started my journey into philanthropy. I started spending time. Then I wanted to go into fundraising. Mm -hmm. I went into a whole bunch of interesting journeys there. You know, when, when the tsunami hit Edie, yep. um, I had this natural impetus to be there uh, within 48 hours of the impact. And the whole world was telling me from, from uh, government administrators to uh, friends and fans and family saying, what are you doing? There could be an epidemic. There could be, you know, uh, a crazy situation there. Mm -hmm. Where are you going to stay? How are you going to live? What are you going to do there? I didn't know, but I just knew I had to do something. Mm -hmm. And I landed up without a plan. Uh, ground zero, 48 hours later, I saw the devastation with my own eyes. Mm. And it was incredible because I was able to leverage that celebrity. And within maybe two days of being there, I had 200 plus youth volunteers who were fans mm. who just landed up, pitched a tent on the beach next to mine right. um, and said, we're here to help. And we galvanized that into a movement and then it became Project Hope. Mm -hmm. And what started as a pure rescue operation uh, and a relief operation went into actually rebuilding villages from scratch. Mm. I had people who were town planners, who were big you know, consultants and architectural firms coming in from Bangalore and saying, service is absolutely free. We want to be a part of what you're doing. Wow. And I created a lateral project where there was no ownership, and yet everybody kind of owned it. There was no mm. vertical thought process that I run this. You know? I'm just enabling. And I realized that that has tremendous power because everybody was a stakeholder. Everybody pitched in. And before you know it, you had the first three smart villages in India rebuilt from scratch within 18 months of the tsunami. Mm -hmm. And we had managed to house more than 1,000 families and recreate jobs for the village economy. So I thought that was extremely powerful. And that's what kind of led me to you know, be more actively involved in philanthropy. Interesting. And so you've moved not just from giving uh, and enabling, but now to investing and starting some social, some companies that have social impact. Tell me why you made that move as well. I think there's a fatigue associated with giving. Mm. There's a fatigue definitely associating with asking. So I do fundraisers, I still do them every year. Donors fatigue is a real thing. It's a real yeah. thing. And, and you know, after some time, people just don't want to take your call because they're like, he's mm. going to ask me to give more yeah. money. Um, and, and putting that out there all the time, and the need is so large, I thought there has to be a better way. There has mm. to be a smarter way. There has to be a way to create something that is more sustainable in terms of giving um, and creating measurable impact. Um, also, you know, you have accountability, but growth is very limited when you're doing something completely non-profit. Mm. Uh, again, it's linked to how much you can raise, what is the raising capability, ethically, how much do you want to spend on that raising? Do you want to do it in a big five-star hotel? Do you want to have Edie Lush uh, you know, on the Help. show uh, helping you auction something? 
so I realized that all of these things are, are hurdles in growth. And if you have a social impact for profit model, mm. you can exponentially scale. Um, so in the last four and a half years, I've co-founded four companies okay. that have all had social impact for profit as their identity. And we've scaled infinitely. I mean, we've had most of the companies growing between 20 to 30 times. So great for investors, great for impact funds, for legacy funds, people who want to carve out a piece of their portfolio. And some places we're returning more hmm. than they get from their conventional returns. And they feel good about it. And the amazing thing about technology today, ED, is that this impact is actually measurable. There's data that you can mm. present crisp and clear. And it's constantly evolving because you have AI and ML in the back end. Uh, so the data is evolving and the measurable impact gets deeper and deeper. You get more data analytics mm. in terms of the actual cause and effect of something that you do. You start with something in mind as an objective, but you realize there's so many more things that are happening simultaneously that you didn't plan, but are serendipitous. And then that adds to deeper data and better understanding, saying that, oh, here's even more impact mm. that you can create. I love that idea of the data exhaust uh, coming out from, and actually having its, own, having its own value and its own impact. Absolutely. Well, let's just take, let's take a couple of these. Let's start with the, the education technology business that you've uh, co-founded. That's right. Okay, so tell me why you chose education technology and what this one specifically does. So I started with looking at the finance side. So I think the, the, the history to it is I had the opportunity of going with the prime minister uh, to Hanover. Mm -hmm. And it just blew my mind at the Mesa to see where technology is going and how the digital revolution is happening, how industrial revolution is happening. And I realized that on the ground, we're far behind as India. We have the brains but we haven't applied them to what the future could be. Mm. Um, so I wanted to bring that into context and I uh, set up a state private university, the first of its kind, uh, which was a startup and innovation university. So that was the beginning. Um, I wanted to create a meeting place of, of educator, educators and minds and create a blend between traditional education, because that's the pressure from the parents, and startups, which can run parallelly. So we were the first university to get a dual degree Mm. Um, uh, capability. But then from there I realized that within education there was a lot of problems with financing education. Unlike the West, education in India is not as expensive. Even mm. if you're looking at you know, purchasing power parity, it's not as expensive. But what happens is, um, say I'm a security guard and I want my child to go to an English medium school which is only 40,000 rupees, mm -hmm. uh, but I make maybe 20,000 a month. And they want me to pay 20,000 up front for the first term. And it is that catch-22 where I'm trying to go out there and raise uh, informal economies, mm -hmm. I'm trying to raise money for that, that I identified as a serious problem. Um, so we started with FinancePeer and we started giving zero collateral loans. Uh, then we went into zero interest loans mm -hmm. uh, where we played factoring stories. And before we know it, in four years, we're partnered with 12,000 schools, colleges, and universities. We have 3 million students. Uh, we have a few investors in FinancePeer here. Uh, the company's grown exponentially, maybe 30 times in the last four years. So that led me to say, what else can I do in education? And that's when I co-founded mm -hmm. iScholar. Okay. And tell me about that. Well, iScholar ED was, the best way to describe it is, it's a digital bridge, okay. right? A physical meets digital. Um, because I realized the focus was only on digital in India. I love that the rest of the world calls it hybrid, but you've created a, a, your own... I, I just love fidgetal. <laughs> okay. Um, now, rather than fidgeting. <laughs> <laughs> so, fidgetal was... The idea was to create a fidgetal bridge between India and Bharat. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very conscious of rural India, and I realized that the growth of India's story is going to be fueled by the rural economy in Bharat. Uh, for the rural economy in Bharat, we have to empower uh, kids there. So you have the best teaching quality in the urban centers, which I call India, um, and you have the most aspirational students mm. in Bharat. So like the, the American dream, I think the Bharati dream is Mira beta engineer banega, you know, meri beti doctor banegi. They either want to be an engineer or a doctor or achieve a government service story. But the access to quality education in the towns uh, of India is lower. Now, what I realized is that there was three kinds of divide. 
The one was a geographical divide. Say I'm from the Northeast, mm -hmm. um, I come down to Delhi, I come down to Kota, to the Kota factory to study. Yeah. Uh, I deal with cultural issues, language issues, um, issues of food, simplest, simplest of things like that. And that leads kids to get into depression. Mm -hmm. They get into fatigue. Uh, they just want to quit and go home, even if they have the talent. Yeah, mental health issues, loneliness, yeah. And the second thing that we realized as a problem was gender. Hmm. So the patriarchal mindset in Bharat, uh, very few parents or families, or even if the immediate parents are okay, the grandparents said, well, you can send the son, but the daughter has to be right here right. in our village, in our town, because otherwise who's going to marry her? We can't send her to the big city. What will they say about her character? So even though she had the ability, she was probably more capable, she was being left behind. She wasn't being able to access really good quality teaching. And the third thing um, that we realized was language. You could have somebody who's brilliant at mathematics but doesn't know a word of English. And when they go to the big cities, they're taught with 60, 80, 200 students in a classroom, um, and it's all in English. So where's the vernacular? And they get left behind, they get disappointed, and they drop out, even after making it mm. this far of cracking of, of, of these exams. You even have people who crack IIT and then drop out from there. Mm. Um, so wanted to address all these three. So what we did was studio style on a proprietary-based technology, created uh, live two-way interactive classes mm -hmm. with teachers uh, in the cities and physical centers in Bharat connected mm. digitally, um, having kids attend in a two-way interactive session. How many kids per person? A max of 30. Max of 30. Because our data told us that beyond 30, um, the actual doubt clearing, the actual mm -hmm. being able to feel like a part of a classroom, connecting with a teacher was very difficult. And then we looped that up back with a fantastic tech backend that gave 24-7 you know, doubt clearing mechanisms. Mm -hmm. You know, Kids study in the middle of the night and they have a doubt, they want to refer back to it. So they get you know, taken back to the exact same uh, video of the lecture in the repository and sometimes specifically to the aspect in the video. Okay. And then we have a, a lot of measurable impact in terms of when a topic is taught, uh, there's an objective question mm -hmm. uh, session, you know, so you fill that up and that questionnaire then gives immediate uh, feedback to not only the students and parents, but also the teachers. Out of 30 kids in a class, if 22, fail to grasp a concept, hmm. then there's something wrong with the, the way the teacher is teaching it. Right. And every teacher has to be multilingual. They have to be able to speak in English and Hindi, or English and Kannada. That ended up creating a fantastic uh, net result for us. And the lectures are in different languages as well. That must have been important. Yes, I mean, the ability to be able to converse in a language that a student can grasp and understand the concepts uh, is exceptionally important. Mm. Uh, English ends up alienating uh, a lot of really bright minds. So you mentioned that you can measure the impact. So what has the impact been? Oh, it's so been far? exceptional. I mean, we've had uh, uh, a much higher success rate uh, than many of the larger organizations uh, that we hear of as unicorns, etc. So the net impact has been exceptional in terms of number of students clearing NEET or IITJ. Uh, so much so that uh, we were fortunate enough to close a partnership deal with MIT hmm. um, uh, and tasked with propagating the MIT course curriculum at a substantial discount hmm. for Indian students uh, across our entire network. So I think they saw what we were doing. They saw that we were quality focused hmm. and uh, they chose us over many more, much more established uh, companies because they realized that we do it in a more focused way uh, and when you sit in a classroom, there's an automatic sense of focus to it. So the idea was to kind of really give the best platform to the students of Bharat and build that human capital out. Interesting. Running out of time, I do want to get you to give me 40 seconds. If I'm an apple farmer now in India, I understand you have an agricultural technology platform. It might be interesting to me too. Yes, well, um, we uh, co-founded a company uh, called AgriBid. Mm -hmm. And if, I mean, everybody's been aware of what's happened with the farm protests in India and the issues with the middlemen. Um, so this whole legacy of the British Raj, of license Raj, of uh, cartelization in APMCs and, and farmer markets 
has really depleted farmer income instead of increasing it. Uh, farmers have been exploited, both in terms of delayed payments, um, then in terms of no transparency in terms of what price their goods were actually sold. They just write in on a piece of paper and said, this is the price. Farmers end up paying 5 to 6% to the market itself, another 5 6% brokerage, mm. another 5 6% in terms of cartage, logistics, um, and this is not counting the labor to harvest. So they're 20% down by the time they reach the market, mm. and that's when they're exploited. So we built the first system of its kind to source from farms directly, consolidate the farmers into FPOs, and give them access to a global market across trading houses, multinationals, uh, SMEs that use you know, food as their raw material, food security programs internationally, within India, public distribution systems. So we built that bridge out with AI. Uh, it's been a huge success story because it's mm -hmm. very simple. It's three clicks for a farmer to figure it out. Um, and the fact that we've achieved four million farmers on the platform mm. and within the next six months are on track to achieve 10 million farmers on the platform is an endorsement in itself. And we've also managed to achieve in just a year and a half a partnership with the World Bank mm. and we've achieved, this is what we're exceptionally proud of, increasing farmer income net to the farmers at 28.5%. Because the intent was never to earn anything from the farmer. We charge them nothing for onboarding them. We charge them no transaction fees. And yet, we're a profitable agri-tech company. Fantastic. All right. We're, we've sadly run out of time. I've got to ask you three very quick questions. All right. Do you prefer playing the good guy or the bad guy? <laughs> um, well, I'm told I'm the good bad guy. <laughs> I feel like that's right in the middle. Okay. Do you prefer filming in Delhi or Dubai? Ooh. <laughs> Remember the That's audience. a tough one. <laughs> uh, I, I can't even say what time of the year because they're pretty <laughs> similar in terms of the climate at the same times of the year. Um, Don't forget, well, thank you. Uh, I think Dubai is. Um, a lot easier mm. in terms of filming. I remember filming in Delhi ED and uh, we were shooting next to the Qutub Minar and we had these cops come up to us and said, they hit their big stick to the camera and I was like, that's a half a million dollar camera, dude. <laughs> and they're like, uh, you can't film here. So we, we have permission. No, you have permission to shoot the Qutub Minar from this angle, but you don't have permission from this angle. So you have to pay us extra for it. So yeah, unfortunately that was Delhi. All right, final question for you. Cricket World Cup or Football World oh, Cup? Oh, Cricket World Cup. All right. That'll be good news to my, uh, my co-host, Mark Barton. I think he's a cricket fan. So thank you so much, Vivek, for joining. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a huge round of applause. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Thank, thank you so you. much.